webinar. This is muscle mechanics of elbow and forearm. We will take a look at some elbow flexors, elbow extensors, supinators and pronators at the elbow joint. Okay, so uh, let's start with a little review. We spoke about the rotational force production um, in class and we spoke about how torque is being affected by uh, force or the moment arm. And what we spoke about a lot in class is the moment arm, right? We covered the musculoskeletal levers. So if you have a longer moment arm, you're going to be able to generate more torque. But if you have a shorter moment arm, there's going to be less torque generated. But another uh, value in torque production is the force. So the force, there are a couple of things that actually affects the force production of the muscle. And one of these things is the physiological cross-sectional area. So basically what it is, is the maximum force potential of a muscle is directly proportional to the cross-sectional area of the muscle. So the larger the cross-sectional area of the muscle, the larger the force production potential there is for the muscle. Um, and it represents how many contractile proteins there are for generating a contraction of the muscle. Of course, there are some other um, factors that affect the muscular force production, such as um, fiber type composition or even the alignment of these fibers right here. But for the purposes of this presentation, we will only cover the physiological cross-sectional area. Low parsimony is something that we spoke about before. It basically states that there is a hierarchical recruitment pattern of this uh, nervous system. So nervous system tends to activate fewer muscle or muscle fibers possible for a control of a given joint action. So what it basically means, we will activate smaller muscles that cross only one joint first, followed by larger muscles. So an example here is inconius that only crosses the elbow joint versus the long head of the triceps that crosses the elbow joint and the shoulder joint. So of course, inconius will be activated for light elbow extension activities. And then if uh, your body requires a little bit more force production, a little bit more torque production, we will activate long head of the biceps later on. Let's take a look at our elbow flexors. So the first one is brachialis, followed by base, uh, biceps, followed by brachioradialis. Let's start with brachialis. That's your primary elbow flexors, and that makes sense because it crosses only the elbow joint, right? It also has the largest physiological cross-sectional area out of all the elbow flexors. So seven centimeters for brachialis, 2.5 and 2.1 for short and long heads of biceps. Um, and 1.5 centimeters for brachioradialis. So obviously seven centimeters win. So it wins because he has the largest, it has the largest cross-sectional area out of all of them. So it's going to be able to generate more torque. It's a strong elbow flexor regardless of shoulder position, of course, because it doesn't cross the shoulder. Forearm position, because it attaches to the ulna, does not attach to the radius. The radius is the one that's going to move. Uh, the ulna will always be aligned with the humerus, even in the closed kinematic chain, as we know that distally they move um, with radio ulna joint, but ulna and uh, the radi the I'm sorry, uh, ulna and humerus will always be aligned. So um, it, it is not affected by the forearm position and muscular activation. So concentric, eccentric, doesn't matter. It will always be the primary elbow flexor. Bicep, as you know, bicep has two heads, the short head that attaches to the coracoid and the long head that attaches to the supraglenoid tubercle. And bicep spans into bicipital aponeurosis superficially and radial tuberosity on the radius. So obviously, because it attaches to the radius for that <clears throat> same reason as um, brachialis is going to be the primary elbow flexors, now, bicep will be affected by the pronation or supinated position of the forearm. So it's a secondary elbow flexor and maximum activity of the bicep um, is noted when the elbow is flexed and supinated at the same time. So if you palpate the mid shaft of your humerus and pronate and supinate your hand, you're going to feel that the muscle barely appears and disappears. Um, and that is the bicep because it's not as active when you're pronating at the elbow joint. Um, also, it acts, of course, it crosses anterior to the shoulder joint, so it acts as a shoulder flexor as well. Brachioradialis, um, it's a secondary elbow flexor, 
most powerful with form in neutral, as we can see here, it has a great leverage. Um, and speaking of leverage, so if you take a look at this picture right here, and we know that brachial radialis, as I mentioned earlier, has a pretty small physiological cross-sectional area. So we know that the force um, production is going to be pretty low, but it actually compensates with its moment arm. It has the longest moment arm from the axis of rotation as compared to bicep and brachialis. These two muscles have shorter moment arms. So in terms of, in terms of torque production, brachial radialis will be able to still provide quite a lot of torque uh, at the elbow joint for elbow flexion. Okay, torque generated by elbow flexors. The flexion torques are about 70% greater than extension torques. And that's interesting because um, it's opposite of the lower extremity. The extension torque for the quads is going to be much greater than the flexion torque for the hamstrings. Um, and elbow flexion torque produced with forearm supinated at 20 to 25% greater than with the forearm pronated. Um, obviously, because you're recruiting uh, bicep, and bicep has a large physiological cross-sectional area. So because bicep is going to be helping out, you're going to be able to produce more torque. Um, let's just take a look quickly at this image right here. So this is a patient flexing an elbow um, in the shoulder flex position versus shoulder extended position. So the difference here is what we're looking at is the contraction velocity. So in the first picture with the elbow flex position, the contraction velocity is seven centimeters and the contraction velocity um, here is five centimeters per second. So this is a slower contraction velocity of bicep. So what that means, the slower contraction velocity, you're going to be able to activate more muscle fibers and thus generate more torque. So this is more mechanically advantageous position. So why that happens is essentially because the um, actin and myosin are overlapping at the elbow joint very fast, but we're extending at the shoulder joint and they actually, um, they're not overlapping as fast at the shoulder joint, as opposed to here where actin and myosin overlaps at the elbow joint as well as the shoulder joint. So here the muscle comes into a shortened position faster than here. And here we're able to generate more torque and more power. Um, and then another thing to note is of course that posterior deltoid will be synergist, will have a synergistic relationship with the bicep because every time you go into flexion, if you uh, perform heavy activities of flexion, um, the long head of the bicep would want to flex the shoulder. So we need something at the shoulder that can uh, maintain a neutral position. So that's going to be the posterior deltoid. So in either case, posterior deltoid, either in this position or this position, if you're recruiting the long head of the bicep, posterior deltoid will be active. Okay, let's move on to our elbow extensors. So of course we know our elbow extensors are triceps and anconius. So triceps has three heads. It has the long head analogous to bicep, but it now attaches to the infraglenoid tubercle. We have the lateral head, which sits on the uh, proximal one third of the humerus and inserts into olecranon. And we have the medial head, which is pretty thick. Uh, but uh, deep to, to both to the rest of the heads. And they all have uh, similar cross-sectional areas. You guys don't need to remember the number, the actual numbers for the exam. Just know, um, just know the size differences. So know that uh, bicep is, cross-sectional area of the bicep is smaller than the cross-sectional area of the brachialis. And of course, anconius has a smaller cross-sectional area than the tricep. Um, and it's active, of course, in elbow extension. It's very much active because it's of its fiber orientation and joint stability. So it compresses the humeral ulnar joint right here and stabilizes the joint capsule as well because some of the fibers of anconius, they blend into the joint cap capsule uh, for stabilization. And it produces 15% of the total extension torque across the elbow. So 
Electromyographic analysis of elbow extension shows that at initiation or low level activities of elbow extension, inconius is active first. Then, once you start increasing in extensor level, once it requires a little bit more torque generation, the medial head of the triceps will kick in and it will remain active for most of the elbow extension. It's also a workhorse of the elbow extensor. So medial head of the tricep is analogous to brachialis at uh, the anterior part of the humerus. And finally, moderate to high level demands of elbow extension will require lateral head of the triceps and long head of the tricep will be recruited last because it crosses the shoulder joint. So obviously, principle of parsimony, we don't want to recruit a muscle that crosses two joints. So that's going to be the last one recruited for a given activity. Torques generated by elbow extensors, once again, just like elbow flexors, we have a synergistic relationship between the long head of the triceps and anterior deltoid now. So if you put your um, hand against your distal radius and ulna against um, a table and try to push your elbow into extension and provide the maximum amount of torque generated, and you can palpate the anterior deltoid, which will resist shoulder extension. So because long head of the tricep will try to extend your shoulder, the anterior deltoid will counteract that action and work as a synergist to provide just pure um, high torque generation elbow extension. Elbow extensors produce maximum level torque when elbow is flexed to 80 to 90 degrees, which is similar to elbow flexors. That's where most of the elbow flexor torque is produced as well. Elbow supinator. So the primary supinator is the supinator, and the secondary is the bicep. And primary, uh, the other primary one, sorry, is the bicep. The secondary supinators are extensor pollicis longus, showing in the picture right here. Extensor indices, of course, showing in the picture right here. And brachioradialis not showing on this picture, but brachioradialis can take you into neutral position from or supinated position or pronated position. So it acts as a pronator and a supinator as well. So supinator, evidence-based action. It supinates the forearm when there is little to no external resistance, obviously because it crosses one joint. So during resisted supination, the bicep activates. Bicep has three times the physiological cross-sectional area compare it to supinator. So the parsimony principle, the supinator will activate first before the biceps. Um, and supinator is more active than biceps when elbow is in full extension. And that is because um, bicep is unable to provide a lot of its torque into uh, uh, supination because we know that uh, it has a shorter lever arm during a full elbow extended position. Okay, and let's take a look at the final example for supinators. So effectiveness of bicep as a supinator is greatest when elbow is flexed to 90 degrees. And we have a synergistic force couple of synergistic relationship between biceps and triceps. So let's just look at the first picture right here for demonstration. Don't worry about the numbers. Don't worry about figuring out, uh, figuring out the torque here. So let's just focus on this picture right here. So a patient is uh, unscrewing um, something or screwing something into the wall. So he's going into supination, so righty tighty. So he's screwing it in, right? So in order to produce um, supination, first he produces very little torque that's created by the supinator muscle. So that's the first muscle to activate. Secondarily, if he needs to put a little bit more force into it, he's going to recruit biceps and he will recruit biceps and biceps would also want to flex at the elbow joint and as well flex at the shoulder joint. So the synergistic relationship of bicep and tricep kicks in with a larger torque production for supination. So triceps will kick in and negate the flexion torque production of the bicep at the elbow as well as flexion torque production of the bicep at the shoulder joint. So primary, it's gonna be uh, primarily it's gonna be the supinator that's gonna kick in first for very like light torque generating activities, followed by bicep that will kick in because you need more force production of course, 
and then tricep will kick in in order to maintain elbow in the neutral position because bicep otherwise would flex it and also to maintain shoulder in a neutral position. So they complement one another's action. Okay, and finally, elbow pronators. So the primary pronator is, of course, pronator teres and pronator quadratus. Pronator teres crosses the elbow joint right here and crosses radial ulnar joint. And pronator quadratus just crosses the distal radial ulnar joint. The secondary flexors are flexor carpi radialis and palmaris longus. So pronator teres, um, the, it's a primary forearm pronator and a secondary elbow flexor. So you know because it flexes at the elbow, if you want to go into pronation, it will go take you into pronation and elbow flexion. So in order to produce forceful pronation without a change at the elbow joint, we will require recruitment of triceps and anconius. So that's going to be another synergistic um, relationship between the pronator teres and triceps. And of course, um, because it crosses the radial ulna joint, it's going to sta um, dynamically stabilize radial ulna joint during pronation and supination activities. Okay, and finally, pronator quadratus, so it sits way far more distally, and it crosses only one joint. So you know it's going to be the primary elbow um, pronator. It dynamically stabilizes the distal radial ulnar joint because you can see that the line of pull will literally pull the radius towards the ulna. And by that, it will stabilize the joint and prevent separation of the two joint surfaces. Slight obliquity in fiber direction, similar angle uh, to as pronator teres. And the line of force almost perpendicular to the forearm axis of rotation. So it has a great uh, force generating capacity and has a great lever arm in order to create more torque for pronation. It guides the joint through its natural arthrokinematics. So pronator teres um, will allow for pronation, interior roll, interior glide of the radius in the open kinematic chain. Okay, hope. It was a good lecture and see you in class.